Deep in the heart of central Iran, the Natanz uranium enrichment facility is buried more than 70 feet below the desert, surrounded by thick concrete walls and guarded with anti-aircraft guns. The Iranians maintained it was to produce fuel for civilian nuclear power, but the U.S. and its allies feared its real purpose was the development of nuclear weapons. The West has long viewed the prospect of a nuclear Iran as a threat to be reckoned with. This issue has been a source of tension between the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And then, one day in 2009, without a bomb being dropped or troops on the ground, the plant in Iran was dealt a blow. A silent agent carried out a seemingly impossible act of sabotage at the Natanz facility. Slipping past the armed guards, it shattered equipment crucial to Iran's controversial nuclear program. 160 centrifuges just breaking apart, metal shards flying everywhere. You literally have shrapnel coming across the room. The agent of destruction? A computer virus, codenamed Stuxnet. And it turned out to be the largest act of cyber sabotage in world history. If you were in that room, you would literally die. You would not want to be in that room when this happened. Eric Chen is a computer virus expert who's been analyzing cyber threats for the last 15 years. He's one of the few people on the planet qualified to discern what actually happened. How big a deal is Stuxnet? I, I don't think there's ever been anything bigger. You know, the closest thing that's been bigger is maybe the advent of the internet. Chen works for Symantec in Los Angeles. It's one of the largest information security providers in the world. While its clients include multinational corporations, there's a good chance its software is installed on your computer at home, too. Last year, Symantec identified millions of cyber threats, but Stuxnet by far was the biggest. The company's team was instrumental in cracking Stuxnet, and what they learned will change the way countries approach warfare in the future. Stuxnet has basically demonstrated to the world that it's possible to take computer code and cause physical real-world damage. Stuxnet crossed over from the virtual world to the real one. The operation was so sophisticated, Chen and his team estimated it took more than 20 high-level programmers with inside knowledge of the plant at Natanz. This is not two hackers in a basement in Kansas somewhere. When we know from the code and the sophistication and the amount of effort that needed to go into it, it had to have the resources at the level of a nation state. And in fact, the New York Times reported in January that Stuxnet was likely a joint project between the Americans and the Israelis. It's not a particularly shocking conclusion, considering that Israel has made little secret of its willingness to attack Iranian nuclear facilities by conventional military means. Stuxnet may have given them the opportunity they've been waiting for without having to even fire a shot. But if it was them, they're not talking. The Israeli government did not respond to our request for comment on who created Stuxnet. We didn't have much more luck with the U.S. The CIA declined comment. The Department of Energy referred us to the National Security Council. They declined comment, too. The Department of Defense and the U.S. Cyber Command sent us to the Department of Homeland Security, who referred us to the FBI. The FBI had no comment and sent us back to the Department of Homeland Security. But U.S. involvement in Stuxnet may have been cagely winked at, like when President Obama's representative on weapons of mass destruction spoke at a conference on Iran back in December. I'm glad to hear they're having problems with their centrifuge machines, and I think that uh, you know the U.S. and its allies are doing everything we can to try to make sure that, uh, that we complicate matters for them. Symantec had to tackle Stuxnet because its business is to understand every computer virus in cyberspace. But even with Eric and his team of experts, the investigation spanned eight long months and became all-consuming. We'd go home and be looking at Stuxnet in our off times. You know, I sat in my bed with my laptop many, many nights over a very long period looking at Stuxnet. So here's what he confronted. Approximately 15,000 lines of computer code. These strings of numbers and letters serve as instructions which tell a program what to do. So from your perspective, I mean, how do you actually parse a computer virus? You know, when we get a piece of malicious software, when we get code, we get literally zeros and ones. And we basically decode those. We look at the numbers and translate them into behaviors. Do you know that it was targeting Iran by looking at the code itself? We discovered it was targeting very specific equipment, 
But we didn't really, for example, identify that it was a uranium enrichment facility until four months after we had first seen Stuxnet. And while it became clear that Stuxnet was focused on that one plant in the Tanzaran, how it got there was still shrouded in mystery. You may be able to trace it back to what oh, an, epide an epidemiologist would call it patient zero. Where did the infection start? But you don't know how that person got infected. Stephen Bellavin at Columbia School of Engineering has seen more than his share of viruses. He's been tracking cybercrime for decades. It did not attack its target over the internet. It was probably carried in by one of these flash drives. That's a portable hard drive, sometimes called a USB key or flash drive. The dominant theory is that Stuxnet started on drives like these. Spies on the ground planted them in key areas, maybe even spots like a parking lot. Places where people who worked at Natanz or people who worked with people who worked at Natanz might find them. Someone picks it up and says, oh, cool, I have a new flash drive, let me use it. When you do that with a Stuxnet one, it affects your computer. So let's take a closer look at how the virus actually works. For our purposes, let's picture Stuxnet as a kind of super saboteur. He starts on a USB drive. It's big for a virus, but still a file so tiny that it's smaller than even one of your family photos, or MP3s. And as soon as he's plugged into any computer, he actually makes a copy of himself. He jumps off the key onto that computer. So you literally plug in a USB key for a couple of seconds, unplug it, and now that computer is infected. He gets into any Windows operating system, just like the one that's probably running on your computer now. And he enters undetected. You wouldn't even know that Stuxnet had jumped into your machine because he sneaks in using something called a digital signature. Imagine an ID card with your picture on it and your name. And using this ID card, the code can say, I came from Microsoft and I haven't been tampered with and you can trust them from Microsoft. But what Stuxnet did was it stole some of those identity certificates from two different companies and basically signed its own software with those certificates. So when that software came onto the computer, Windows said, oh, this looks legitimate. You come from a trusted vendor and allowed Stuxnet to run. Now, once Stuxnet is loaded into a computer, it starts looking for ways to spread, ways out. Let's call them doors. It can spread in one of several different ways. It can look for other flash drives. It can spread to your file server. It can spread to a uh, print spooler if you're sharing a printer with other people. So Stuxnet can get around pretty well that way, but don't worry. He's not interested in breaking home computers. It's a carrier. Think Typhoid Mary. She carried the typhoid germ. She wasn't sick from it. That's what your home computer would be like. It wouldn't slow it down. It might try to infect other computers, but it's not going to do any damage to your computer. Remember, the only computer Stuxnet's really interested in breaking is that one in Natanz. He's basically looking for something very particular. It's basically a mini computer that's running factory automation. Stuxnet checks door after door, looking for that one specific computer that's so vital for the plant's operation. And this is the exact same model that would have been running in the facility that Stuxnet targeted. But this thing is smaller than a toaster. Yeah, I was actually surprised when I got it. I had never seen it. Believe it or not, you can just buy one online, which Chen and his team did when they were trying to get to the bottom of Stuxnet. It may not look like much, but this little module actually controls those centrifuges that are spinning up nuclear fuel. And when Stuxnet finally finds it, it begins unleashing destruction. Now, the centrifuges are already spinning near the speed of sound, but Stuxnet starts turning them even faster. Well, you're spinning the centrifuge twice as fast as it's supposed to go. Just think of uh, the tack on your car with that nice red line saying you're not supposed to run the motor more than 6,000 RPM you, or you'll damage your motor. And that's how Stuxnet destroys the centrifuges, essentially wrecking those very delicate, very expensive pieces of equipment. Isn't it one of the major jobs of a enrichment facility to be monitoring for, for centrifuges spinning out of control? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's multiple safeguards. But Stuxnet gets around those. Stuxnet's pretty smart. It, it gave a fake readout to get, say, it's running at the normal speed, boss. It's not doing anything it's not supposed to. You've programmed it to do something. It's doing it. And you can look at your screen and see it's doing it correctly. And unknown to you, the motor is spinning twice as fast and damaging your centrifuge. So Stuxnet tricks the computer into thinking that everything is just fine. But people work at those plants too. 
people with eyes and ears. The noise alone would be very abnormal, be extremely loud. And there'd be someone in the control room who would literally hear something going wrong. And they have a big red button, literally, to shut down the system. And Stuxnet would hijack that. So they would hit that big red button, Stuxnet would go, sorry, I'm running, and totally ignore the fact that this shutdown sequence has been initiated. Workers would have to just sit helplessly by as the enrichment process fell apart before their eyes. The story of Stuxnet turned out to be the first salvo in a new kind of war. It's a war that doesn't require standing armies or multi-million dollar fighter jets. Cyber war? I need a room full of computers, 20 to 30 people. How are you going to tell this from any other uh, office building with a server room and 30 programmers? There is a veil of anonymity in cyberspace. It is very hard to detect and track, and then, of course, to disrupt your adversaries. To better understand the impact of Stuxnet on the future of warfare, we visited the Naval Postgraduate School to talk with Professor John Arquilla. He's a former advisor to Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and he's the man who coined the term cyber war. Ballistic missiles come with return addresses. That's pretty easy. Uh, this is very, very different. Arquilla is worried that the next time a Stuxnet hits, it'll attack our infrastructure. Maybe it doesn't have to be a centrifuge. It could be the automatic controls on an oil pipeline. It could be something that regulates a dam or a nuclear reactor. And the fact that a policy choice was made somewhere to do this, to engage in this kind of attack against another, says that it's open season now. A big downside of a cyber weapon is that once you attack someone with it, their programmers now have the code. Now the Iranians possess that weapon and can perhaps re-engineer it. It's a legitimate fear. A survey by McAfee, a large cybersecurity company, supported the idea that militaries in several countries have done reconnaissance and planning for cyber attacks, mapping the underlying network infrastructure and locating vulnerabilities for future attack. They talked to executives from the energy, oil, gas, and water sectors about cyber risks in their companies. 85% of them detected some network infiltration in their systems. It's an arms race, and it's, it seems to be a never-ending arms race, and it probably will be a never-ending arms race. With tens of thousands of new cyber threats appearing every day, it's likely that the long nights Eric Chen spent on Stuxnet will not be his last. Every time we put new types of protection in place, attackers attempt to try to get around that. And when they do that, we then try to defeat them. It's back and forth, and it's cat and mouse for sure. You too can embark on a top secret mission to disable a covert nuclear program. Play the role of Stuxnet in an interactive game you'll find on the Need to Know site. On the next edition of Need to Know. Wounded in Iraq, Scott 